Good day to you and your household. Thanks for tuning in. Time for another edition of the podcast. I've been considering naming this something. I don't know how many months in I am now. Uh, Four, five, four, three. I don't know. Time, my goodness, it flies by so quickly. I've been considering naming this, I don't know, primarily because I really love doing that stuff. And and I'm finding some clarity... Now that I'm in several months at the least on just my ridiculousness that I said at the outset and reference every once in a while in regards to anything I do that would be an endeavor that I can brand, (laughs) name something, make it catchy, make it look cool, make it slick, all those things I've, um, due to God's goodness and in compassion and help, um, I've just not done that with this, and that feels good. It's just very freeing. Um, we know ourselves better than anyone else knows us, and I know myself. And so I'm just thankful to God for what He's done to change me. And and so I guess I've just been asking myself, not that that's even necessary or matters. I know I I'm not hung up on it or saying it's necessary or even has any purpose really whatsoever. Um, I don't know. I've just thought about whenever I do a lead in or an intro to these episodes that I just say, hey, welcome to my podcast. Maybe that's fine. Whatever the case, I'm glad you're listening. Hey, I don't care what we call it as long as you listen. I'm, I'm, I'm satisfied. And um, I do hope and pray that God is speaking to you um, in whatever means He has placed you within circumstances, people, questioning things, the the constant reevaluation of your heart's condition, not just your behavior, but the condition of your heart and the the overflow of that heart out of your lips. What is your heart meditating on? You know, these things that we have to begin to just implement in our life to be habitually practiced. You know, I mean, hopefully gone are the days when we realize at the end of a day, like, oh man, I just didn't pray today. I didn't converse with my creator (laughs) Or I didn't really think I didn't really think along the lines of a spiritual man today. Man, the day's gone, or days, or a week, and then we try to you know shake it off and readjust ourselves and our thinking and what we're giving ourselves to. You know, may we be maturing individuals who aren't constantly doing our own miniature version of backsliding. You know, that, that that is the the sign, the fruit of a ever-maturing spiritual man walking in Christ's likeness is that it's just ongoing. It, it is always active in us, in no way seasonal or squeezed into the day or days that we, quote, have enough time for it. You know, that that would just become who we are. And what a blessing for us to be literally joining ourselves with the eternal purposes of God on the earth. It's just fascinating. It, re- it still remains so captivating to me of the invitation. The broad invitation to all mankind and then to those who hear and respond. Then the more precise, narrow way invitation to walk in the way and in the manner of Jesus the Christ, the embodied Emmanuel, God with us, and then thereby be in the kingdom and literally be the manifestation, the demonstration of the eternal Yahweh God up on the earth. My goodness, y'all, what a, what an opportunity we have been given in complete undeservedness absolutely undeserving are you and I. But you know what? God sees different. He thinks differently. And amen for that. What an awesome 
awesome opportunity we have. I'm thinking this morning as I'm driving out to work that I'm looking at area gardens um, in close proximity to our house. Of course, I'm very familiar with our garden's present condition. Here it is. It's, I don't know, we're nearing the very end of June, the last week of June. The garden is in a pretty good place. We were very behind getting it in. Um, Everything today, not today, this season rather, went straight seed to ground. Uh, Two years previous, we had a small greenhouse um, that was wiped out by the the snowstorm that we had this last winter. Uh, Literally caved under the pressure (laughs) and uh, was not replaced yet. And so Kristen, albeit two years previous, was very good at plant starts in her greenhouse and so they'd go straight into the ground already pretty in a pretty good condition with a good amount of time behind them sprouted root systems established Um, but this year everything for the most part had to go straight into the ground with seed and so we're a little bit behind we had so much rain we just were really stalled out and so I'd say that our garden is a little bit stunted Um, as far as where I wish we were this time of year. And we moved our garden this year further out from our house um, on the back line of our property. And so it's a good, I don't know, 80 yards away at least from the the back of our house. Um, And we have a very large number of deer in our area. I mean, we're surrounded by woods and just farmland, open acreage with cattle. And so, obviously, there's a high deer population. Well, apparently, we've reached their comfort zone moving the garden out a a little bit further this year um, because our bean sprouts that were probably, well, not probably, were absolutely our most, um, I don't know, they were flourishing. (laughs) The beans were doing awesome. Uh, They were knee-high, flowering. I mean, they were they were coming on good. Well, three nights ago, we had some plants that had been nibbled on and uh, deer hoof prints all throughout that area of the garden. And the next night, two nights ago, uh, apparently they liked the first night. It was a nice little, little appetizer because they came back and they really went to town <laughs> um, and cut the beans in half at the very least. I mean did some serious munching on them. And so now they're stunted and our, our most advanced plants are, are now um, not in very good condition. And so, and then, you know, our, our other plants, I'm not going to name them all off. They're just kind of small and, you know, they're, they're going to be producing and they're already starting to flower, which is good, of course, but they're just kind of small. And so as I drove out this morning, our, our neighboring gardens... Um, like I just saw some squash or zucchini plants or something that, oh my gosh, I mean, they're like otherworldly huge. The leaves, I think you could sit on them. (laughs) They're just massive. The plants are huge. Um, most everything in their garden is just four or five times larger than what we have. And, and I, and this is why I'm bringing this up, um, we believe in more organic gardening ourselves. We, I don't want to eat pesticides and crazy fertilizers that were all formed and created in a lab somewhere. And like, you're not even supposed to let touch your skin, um, but we spray it on our food <laughs> and on the soil that makes our food. And in our case, goes down into the ground and into my well that I drink the water from. So I'm, we're just not proponents at all. We don't use any kind of chemicals like that. Weed killers, bug killers, you know, animal deterrents, any of those types of things that we would say are just kind of toxic. Um, we just don't use those. So miracle Grow, I don't know, all the crazy weed killers, which would be nice, of course, if you're willing to sacrifice like your life, um, and your health. (laughs) Um, but we don't use anything like that. And so the, the thinking is, and this is kind of where I'm going with the spiritual application of this 
is that whenever I see a garden for the past couple of years that may just look like wildly successful, like just, wow, look at that garden. They're so big and so green and man, there's not one weed in it. And holy cow, that's like the epitome of a perfect garden, right? I mean, that's kind of the thinking initially at the outset is a a very desirable garden condition. Because you look at my garden and if I'm not in there a couple times a week weeding it by hand, um, the grass, the field grass and the weeds are obviously going to just overrun it. I mean, there's no way around it. And if we don't take care of the bugs by removing them by hand and spraying natural um, deterrence on them, which are, of course, not nearly as successful and give they don't give the results as traditional, well, traditional in the modern day sense, herbicides, pesticides, right? So, obviously our garden... At, you know, if you just look kind of topically, like, wow, <laughs> your garden stinks. Look at that guy's garden. But here's the thought, right? Here's where I'm thinking this morning. I don't, I don't ascribe to the, the, to the thinking that that garden is better just because of what it looks to be. Even if it's got tomatoes the size of my head, does that necessarily mean, just according to my natural thinking, that it's somehow better? Does that mean it's more fruitful and producing something better than what our garden will produce, albeit probably much smaller and maybe not as attractive to the eye? Um, I recently made an order. I found this, and maybe if you use Facebook, if this has come across your feed or it's probably very specific to things you're quote, interested in, of course, that they think we're interested in, and then they try to, you know, just slide in some some advertising according to our preferences. I get that. Something that came across my ads on Facebook was, I don't remember what it's called, Misfit Market or something like that, and basically they sell highly discounted organic produce um, that's like the scratch and dent version of produce. They're just kind of the ugly ones, the bumpy ones, um, the near expiration date ones, you know, the ones that most people would would just kind of pick up, look at, snarl, and put back down. Well, it's not pretty enough, right? It's not, that just doesn't look like something in my brain has been programmed to say is a good piece of fruit or a desirable vegetable. Because we've just been told that it has to look like a photo (laughs) to be, quote, good. And, of course, there's been genetic modification to make everything more appealing to the eye. Shinier, bigger, shaped more precisely perfect. But you know what? If you've not gone to a farmer's market like a real one or grown produce yourself, you might not realize how weird the perfect fruit is. Because it's been designed by men to look that way. And people buy it. It works. And people have been convinced in our day and age that, like, if that pepper is bent, oh, I don't want that. That one's no good. Right? Why would I want that one? Oh, here's a perfectly pleasing to the eye, perfect and whatever has been programmed in my brain, pepper, I'll choose it every time. And so in that train of thinking, I wonder about things spiritually and if we we examine things so closely. How quick are we in spiritual matters, whether we look at ourselves or whether we look at others, whether we look at movements, and like we, we assess these things, I would say, the same way spiritually as we, do in the, as we do things in the natural. That I think if we're not careful in our immaturity and in our, even in our ways of thinking that are just wrong, how we assess things that we think have, 
we have been taught, and literally, I don't, I don't think this is an overuse of this word, if we have been programmed to think according to certain patterns of thought towards spiritual matters that, that are very equal to what I'm sharing about in the natural. That we too casually just kind of pick up something in our life or that comes across our path in a spiritual perspective, in a spiritual application, and we just kind of brand it right or wrong, good, bad, pleasing or not. And in our casualness, again, according to the program thinking that we have been given, that's been handed down to us through culture, through teaching, through biblical teaching, through religion, I just can't help but wonder if we do the same thing. If we just kind of pick it up and say, oh yeah, that's good. I like the way that looks. I like the way that feels. That looks like what I've been told, although be, uh, it may be subliminally told to us. That's what I've been told is right. And so when these, these things come our way that maybe oppose that, I would say, Sometimes, many times perhaps, we overlook them because they're not seen to us, they're not defined as desirable. Example, the path of Jesus Christ, the, the way, the truth, the life, the new and living way, the, the instating of something new. Y'all, it was a very undesirable way. Let's look at what just a tiny bit of what happened when Jesus was on the earth. The theme, even by his closest friends, his best disciples, what was it? Jesus, no, 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 don't go that way. This way is going to hurt you. It's going to hurt us. It's going to cost us greatly. This isn't the best way, Jesus. Let us help you, right? Let us help you, Jesus. We know a better way. We know a better way, Jesus. Listen to us, and we'll tell you the better way. Free from suffering, free from persecution. The desirable way, right? That was what was presented to Jesus, and he either called them Satan or told them to get out of there because they didn't even know what kingdom he was promoting and presenting for them to likewise walk in. He had nothing to do with that. And we understand that this far removed. We, looking back, we think we know better. Well, those disciples, foolish they were. They just, they missed the kingdom. <laughs> the personification of the kingdom was in a man, in a bodily form right in front of them, and they missed him. Oh, poor disciples. Are we really any different? Are we pleased with the results and the fruit of the pattern of the way, the truth, and the life, Jesus the Christ? Are we, are we seeking out the less desirable fruit of life? Because I would say that this culture, that we are right in the middle of on this earth, the Christian culture says, I believe, the miracle grow way of Christianity. Spray this, do this, plant in this, and boom, you will have awesome fruit. Go to a Bible study, have an accountability group, listen to Christian radio, play Christian sports, and poof, you will be a shiny, beautiful, acceptable Christian. But friends, I wonder if that's even true. I wonder if we have bought into the same lie as we see in natural culture of, no, don't, don't eat that. Don't do that. Don't work in your garden. Don't take out those weeds by hand. Don't pick off those bugs by hand. That's too hard, friend. That's too, you shouldn't have, oh, you should never have to do that. Don't you know there's a spray for that? Don't you know there's some stuff you can sprinkle on that and you won't have to do anything? You shouldn't have to work so hard. 
right? I mean, seriously, y'all, let's stop and think about that pattern of thought according to the ways of Christianity and, quote, following Jesus. Jesus was the epitome of the hard way. He denied himself. And that's the way that he has called us unto. And so when I see my neighbor's gardens, you know, I'm not envious. I'm not jealous. I don't look at their gardens and say, oh, I wish I could have a garden like that. Unless I know that they have done that through the way that I believe is the best, safest, most desirable way according to my viewpoint, which is safety of food that goes in my body. Why should I care what it looks like if it's just going to go into my mouth? We care more about how something looks than what it's made up of. Can we not say that is true? Our pattern that we have been given puts value on the wrong things. We have been fed a diet throughout our lives of Christianity that says you do all you can to look good and you're fine. If you can just be a shiny red perfect apple, You've attained the goal. You have done what is necessary. But I would say this morning, just like those gardens, that's not the goal. The goal is not to be the prettiest, best looking, most pleasing to the eye fruit. In light of spiritual matters and maturity and the representation of God on the earth. The church, I would say, has tried so hard to paint herself as all together and right and good and upstanding and honorable and moral and absolutely right. Flawless, even. That we've lost the heart of why we're even to be changed. And so I would say this morning, like what in me, what in you, is the product and the fruit of just spraying some things on your life to make it look like your garden is awesome. The garden of your heart, the garden of your life, the fruit that comes from your life. How did it get there? What's the condition of the soil? What's in there? Because really... What if the fruit is toxic, y'all? What if the fruit, albeit shiny and perfect and pleasing to the eye, is actually detrimental to us and to the greater body at large? Because it's not created the way it was intended. Because the nutrients within it are lacking, if they're at all. Limited at best. That's, That's blatantly true and widely known and accepted throughout the agriculture community that I even know little about. Yeah, well, most of the nutrients aren't even there anymore, but did you see that watermelon? Did you see that thing? Boy, that thing's beautiful. Oh, man. And it may even taste awesome. It may be sweeter, no seeds, no nothing. Like, we've Look, listen to this. Like, we've taken everything undesirable out. So, y'all, you just cut that big bad boy open and you eat every bite. Doesn't that taste good? Oh, well, where's the seeds? Oh, don't worry about that. We've grown it so they're not even there anymore. You don't want to have to spit out a seed, do you? What kind of trouble is that? (laughs) Really? Do we think along those lines of the ludicrous proposals that are given to us? And does anybody ask spiritually or physically, okay, well, this looks awesome, but how did it get to that condition? How did it arrive here? I don't feel bad because I do that spiritually. I believe that's wisdom to discern things. When I meet a person and on the surface, they may seem like, boom, supernatural man. 
For whatever reason, I don't just buy it. I don't bite into that fruit and say, amen, look at that. I don't know. I don't know. Movements, people, ministries, preachers, fellowships, I don't buy it until I've seen how they get to that place. I don't know. We have to discern some things, friends. We have to discern what were the ingredients that went into the fruit that I'm seeing. How did they get there? Is it according to the narrow way principles that Jesus Christ, who denied himself and learned himself through the very things that he suffered, he learned obedience? By a denying himself lifestyle, an undesirable way, if we can make a crystal clear connection for the sake of metaphor, he went out and weeded his garden every day by hand. He removed the insects one by one. He worked that land. He cultivated the soil. He made everything in his heart worked and prepared to receive the seed of God so that it could produce its yield in due time, so that there could be a harvest because the ground was prepared, not because something magical was placed on it within it to produce fruit that he, had to not, he, that he didn't labor into. Are we laboring into the things of the Lord? Or do we think, hey, we're, we're in the age of grace, brother. We're in the age of grace and, and God's favor. God's just pouring out favor like a, like a giant watering can in heaven. We're just basking in the glory, brother. He's so good. Well, yes, amen, he sure is. But what are we doing? Are we who claim to be the body, according to the name of Jesus Christ, his representation, are we following in his way? Intending to, working the garden of our life, or when something is presented to us, however it comes, whether through religious or personal or whatever is presented to us as an option or an opportunity to advance our spiritual condition and in, in presentation be more Christ-like, do we step back and say, is this the pattern of Jesus? Is this what he did? Do we even know? Is this what he did? Because I don't see a pattern of Jesus taking the, the easy way, the easy approach, the, hey, you don't have to do all that, brother, approach. He did not do that. He said, yes, do what you're doing and even more. Hey, you over there, millionaire, yeah, you can come into the kingdom, sell everything you have. Don't hold anything back. We have to live according to that pattern, y'all. Of the willingness to give ourselves to laboring unto the kingdom. So we were not going to get into all, what does that mean? What does that look like? I'm not going there today. We talk about that a lot, of course. But I'm just saying from the approach of the gardening aspect, the gardening metaphor, I can't look at a natural garden nor the heart of any man from a surface level assessment and see shiny, bright, attractive fruit and awesome, bountiful plants and just, oh yeah, that's good. Must be good. No, we have to peer deeper into ourselves, into one another, into ministries, into preachers, into churches, and say, okay, well, what's the source? How did this that I'm looking at get to where it is? So that we're clear. So that we have discerned things properly, and that we're walking as wise, mature men. Hearing what the Lord says is right and good. So today, may that challenge you. It challenges me. I want to look at the garden of my life and be like, okay, my spiritual condition today is X. How did I get to where I'm feeling today? How did I get to where I'm believing today? To my position on any matter. To my, my thoughts towards a brother. 
towards my thoughts towards my household, towards the thoughts on reflecting on my own spiritual condition as I define that. Like, how did I get to this place? What's the, what's the soil sample of my heart? What's the soil condition of my spiritual man? So be encouraged today. Look around you. How is God speaking? How is he teaching us? How is he revealing a truth through everyday mundane things like your neighbor's garden? Be looking, be asking, and believing he's going to, going to speak to you. Speak to his people because that's who he is. He's a God who speaks. So may we be found listening. Amen.